Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome everybody to our first live session of Ramadan Live this year at uh, Cambridge Muslim College. Uh, apologies for the uh, short uh, or slight delay that we had, just setting up the, uh, just setting everything up really. Um, as you all come in, uh, it will be really nice if you want to just uh, mention where, you, where you're joining us from. So you can just see already we've got someone from Mauritius. Uh, Wa alaikum assalam. Very nice to have all of you here. It's uh, really, really nice to be back with you all. Uh, at the uh, doorsteps we are, find ourselves, of the uh, holy month. We've got a salam from Calgary. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullah to Abdullah Sattar from Oman. Ahlan wa sahlan to Hafiz. United States. South Africa, UK, not to forget the UK is represented as well. Uh, Turkey, Bahrain, Kent, very, very good. Uh, if you have any issues with the sound at all, you can just uh, say something now while, while I've got my eye on the uh, chat. Um, inshallah ta'ala, we'll be uh, starting in just, uh, I'll just give another minute or so just for people to uh, join us. If you have any questions you'd like to share uh, for the session, I'll be speaking for uh, not more than an hour, inshallah, for sure. And so we should have a good amount of time for, di for discussion. And so if you uh, have questions, you, you will be seeing a link here where you can uh, add your questions and they'll come to a, a document that I'll be viewing. And I'll look at your questions right at the end. Uh, many greetings from our colleagues who've joined us from, we've got Washington, Toronto, Germany, India. Yeah, this is, this is wonderful. Um, Alhamdulillah, it's a real honor and pleasure, really, to be connecting with, with uh, all of you. And inshallah ta'ala, without further ado, uh, with further ado, I will uh, jump in, uh, inshallah, to start the presentation. Okay, so my course, my short course uh, for this year's Ramadan Live is entitled Verses on the Verdia. Now, the word Verdia uh, refers to the beautiful green growth that comes forth from the ground, all forms of you know, shrubs, vegetation, but really emphasizing that vibrant green, the color of life. And the theme of life, the living earth, the producing earth, the feeding, nourishing earth, is a theme that comes in the Holy Quran a very, very great deal. In fact, as I was going through the Holy Quran, looking at various verses that deal with this topic, I was surprised that you literally do not find a surah, you do not find a chapter of the Holy Quran free from some reference to vegetation or the processes that bring forth life uh, from the earth. Uh, throughout the Holy Quran, you turn chapter by chapter, chapter by chapter, chapter by chapter, until you get maybe to the very short chapters that you might find uh, some surahs that might not be, not involve in some explicit way, this theme. And so this theme then, it really is at the bedrock. It really is a foundational metaphor in the Holy Quran. It really is something the Holy Quran wants us to connect to a very great deal uh, from a number of angles. And what's also fascinating is that it's a theme which uh, informs the very vocabulary usage of the Holy Quran. Words that we might use a quite a fair bit to speak about faith unbelief, hypocrisy, success, uh, so many words we will associate with our faith, uh, the, the obligatory arms, and how many of them come back to the metaphor of the living earth. 
And so it's not really possible to do justice to the metaphor, really, not in five lessons, not in 20 lessons. But what I hope we'll be able to do in the time that we have is to really get a very good taste, a very, very good sense of how the Quran wants us to view, to connect with, to learn from the living earth that we inhabit. And if we look at this uh, overview of, the, of how the Quran speaks about this living earth, you realize that the Quran is really emphasizing that this life comes about between two factors, gifts from heaven and protection from earth. And so the seed, and obviously that's our theme uh, uh, this year in Ramadan Live, it's about sowing the seed. And so the seed is this hidden vulnerable being. It sort of lives right here under the earth, uh, helpless, you could say. But as we're going to see, all of life on earth is helpless were it not for that seed. Because whether it's an animal that eats an animal that eats an animal, life on earth at some point needs vegetation. And that is the gift of God. And this vegetation springs forth from this little, little seed under the ground where no one can see it but God, and we'll be talking about that. And the way the Quran depicts this, this cycle, there is the gift from heaven that pours down, and this is rain. And rain is a huge thing in the Holy Quran, that gift of rain that pours down. And then you have this protective earth that protects the seed, keeps it safe, and the food from heaven feeds it, and then suddenly you get this beautiful growth. And so it's between heaven and earth that the story of vegetation is found. And the Quran wants us to relate to it in so many ways. And it's in exploring these ways that this course is uh, going to lay out for us. How are the various ways the seed gives us to think about our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this meeting between heaven and earth, which is really the the flourishing of the seed that God protects in the earth. We'll be seeing how within the Holy Quran, we are meant to know God through this vegetation. Uh, and obviously gratitude is emphasized a very, very great deal because like I said, every living creature on earth is needy for God's protecting that seed and bringing that seed to fruition. And so just feeling gratitude for this incredible system that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed for us. And therefore need, need and gratitude, two, two pillars. You, you realize how much you need and you feel the, the appreciation of that. It's a metaphor for the reality of life in so many ways. Just as you come from the ground and then from a seed and the seed is kept in a safe place, and then you come out into this earth. And so the Quran draws a mirror between the flourishing of man from his seed and the flourishing of vegetation from its seed. But the metaphor doesn't just end there because then the Quran emphasizes how that beautiful lush vegetation also dies and comes to nothing. I, it also has its end, it isn't forever. Uh, and so sometimes the reality of life in the Holy Quran is expressed in the terms of, look at this beautiful growth. It's colorful, it's vibrant, but then it wilts and then it dries and then it's lifeless and then it's blown across the earth. And so it's something for us to think about our own lives. And then the reality of our life is of course the eternal life. And there also the Quran comes back to the metaphor. If you want to know, can the dead come back to life? What's the recurring Quranic answer? Well, look at that dead earth. And then the rains fell and then poof, all this beauty comes forth. The one who does that, he will bring the dead back to life. And so the whole cycle of life from your birth to your death to your beginning, 
even to your time under the ground, the Quran will make parallels. The, the, the body is under the earth, and of course, the seed under the earth. And when the time comes for the growth to come forth of the seed, similarly, the time will come for the earth to open. And then that life anew will come. So the whole image of life and every aspect of life is in this metaphor. And I call this a fundamental metaphor because, like I said, it informs so much of Quranic vocabulary and religious vocabulary that hopefully in our journey, which can only be through selections, really, of this huge Quranic theme, we'll get an appreciation of the vocabulary of the Holy Quran as pertains to this metaphor. And so we're going to, in our little journey today, have about five stops, if you like, as we think about this. And the story will be reflective. I'll be opening up avenues of how to reflect and relate to these verses and these images and these lessons. But by no means will I be drawing these images you know, to a close. I'll be opening up avenues. And the goal and the hope is that each of you and myself will, will dwell in those, in those avenues. We will think about it. We will reflect throughout this month in our prayers, in our recital, and with each other, by all means, you know, use the, use the chat, use even the, you know, the, the uh, question link, just to share your reflections. You can say, well, I was reciting this verse, and I really, you know, related to the sky in this way, I related to the earth in that way. It's a time, this is a contemplative space. My goal is to open up avenues and for you to show me, and for me to share with you, where all of this is uh, taking us, what, what thoughts have uh, opened up for us, uh, and so on. And so in today's lesson, I just want to lay out the overview, uh, just to give us a sense of the seed as we set off on this journey, and something about how primary this uh, imagery really is. And then in our second stop next week, the theme is the nourishing sky, because like I said, it's a story between heaven and earth. The week after that is the nurturing earth and different ways the earth uh, is presented for us to relate to. In the fourth week is what I'm simply calling God's tree. Everything is God's. We are God's. The sky is God's. The sun is God's. Everything is God's. But from this vegetation and from this whole image, which I've painted so far, what is the most majestic form of vegetation that comes down from the earth? It is the tree. It grows and grows and into this incredible structure, really strong, really heavy. We make our homes from it. We make our doors from it that, that protect us, that we hide behind. This tree, as the most impressive site of vegetation, finds itself mentioned within the Holy Quran in so many ways in the afterlife, at the edges of the universe, at the most important moments in human history, the tree, the tree, the tree, the tree. And of course, the very beginning of man is a story of a tree. And so trying to simply view these most important moments of human existence from the beginning of man till the end of man and some important stops in between, just looking at that most impressive growth, the tree. And finally, is just some selected metaphors within the Holy Quran uh, to just uh, about whether it's human, um, you know, the, the growth of a child, the birth of man, some, me some metaphors that tie together the uh, themes of our course, uh, inshallah ta'ala. So those are five stops today. Uh, just to introduce and give us a sense of how rich, how important, how central the, the theme is and set the scene for our, uh, for our journey, we have a, a small section on Quranic firsts. I'll present to you the first dua of the Quran, the first story of the Quran, the first good news of the Quran, the first instruction of the Quran. And in these four firsts, you get a sense of how important this metaphor really is. Uh, the second stop is what I'm calling the mysterious seed. The seed is 
a mystery of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Really it is, because like I said, the whole story of life is waiting for that seed to be split under the ground and to come forth as food and vegetation. But the seed nobody sees and nobody tends to. The most we do with the seed is put it where, where we can't see it. We have no activity with the seed at all. It is the mystery of God. And just like it's mystery with us that we need it so much and we, and we can only benefit from it when we put it where we can't even see it. Uh, similarly, within the Holy Quran, although the theme of vegetation is so rich and so oft repeated, the mention of the seed is very, very little within the Holy Quran. The seed itself, it's that protected being. It's that little mystery. And so just some of the key verses that deal with the seed itself are what we will look at today. Uh, very few and very interesting. And all of it is about mystery. Uh, that's why I think it's mysterious, the, the seed itself. The third is just two Quranic passages, just to remind us of balance as we approach the bits and pieces of the metaphor, just to remind us when you zoom out, it's a story of incredible balance that we have to bear in mind as we enter it. The fourth, I call here safety, and I call later on gratitude. Uh, it's just a reminder of, you know, the beauty of vegetation and the beauty of balance. It ties to something that we have to always, rem always remember, which is safety and peace. Uh, one does not uh, enjoy these very subtle and delicate blessings uh, in times of war, in times of fear, in times of chaos. And so there's something about peace. Uh, that vegetation is intrinsically tied to. And of course, peace is what faith is tied to. And so just uh, setting the scenes then for our exploration is where our journey will take us today. Very good. Let's look at some Quranic firsts, just to give us a real sense of how fundamental the metaphor really is, the metaphor that we are uh, exploring today. What is the first instruction in the Holy Quran? This is my first question. You start reading the Quran. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Maliki, Al-Medin. You read Surah Al-Fatiha. Then you start Surah Al-Baqarah, Alif, Lam, Meem, Dalik, Al-Kitab, La Rayba, Fihi, Hudal, Al-Muttaqeen. And you continue, continue, continue. What's the first time God says to people, do something? What's the first instruction? This, my friends, is the first instruction. The first instruction is an instruction to all of people. O oh people, that is the first instruction. Ibadah is about lowering yourself, abasing yourself before the Almighty negating yourself, negating any sense of importance or worth, because you realize the one in, fr in front of you, that is the one of all worth and all importance. And you lower yourself in front of that one. Oh, you who believe, lower yourselves, humble yourselves, devote yourselves utterly to who? First of all, The one who is worthy of absolute, singular, complete, dedicated devotion. Who is this one? The first thing you're told is that this one is your, is your Rabb. The Rabb is the one who nurtures you. Just, just like I said, and as we'll be seeing, you yourself are a little seed buried in a safe place, waiting to grow and come out and be nourished. And so the Rabb is the one who cares for you at every single stage of your existence, from your little seed and all the way up to where you are today. He takes you stage by stage by stage, nurturing you and caring for you. That being is the one to whom you should be utterly devoted and humbled. What else, is, what else are you told about the being? The second thing you're told is that he's the one who created you. 
means to, first of all, to plan, to determine a, a model, if you like, and then to bring it into, a, into existence. He's the one who planned you and he brought you forth. Not just you, but also those before you, your mummies, your daddies, and their mummies, and their daddies, and their mummies, and their daddies. So just like you're a little seed that came forth, you came forth from other seeds, and other seeds, and other seeds, and other seeds. The one who was there for, from, for your species, right from the beginning, isn't it fitting that you should be utterly devoted to him? And then there's the third reason that brings us to this very first instruction of the Holy Quran. What is the third reason? He is the one who made for your sake this earth into a firash. A firash is like, a, it's used nowadays in modern Arabic for like a mattress. In, in traditional Arabian li living rooms, even today, it is like a, simply a mat or a, like, like, like a foam mat. Uh, people just sit on, normally on the ground, and they sit and they talk and they have tea. They call that a firash. Uh, you might sleep on it. You might sit on it. So the firash, they say in classical Arabic, is when you roll out a, a cloth, a soft cloth, so you can sit on it. So this earth is your bed. This earth is your sofa. This earth is your beautiful sitting place. It's not lava, it's not thorny, it's not unbearable. You live on it. This is the ground. He made this entire earth your bed. And he made the sky over you like a, like a construction, a roof. This is God's house. So we might all live within our own homes. Some of us might have mansions. Some of us might have something much more humble. But in truth, the real home is the home of this earth, where the earth is the bed and the sky is the ceiling, and we are all guests in God's house. This earth is God's house, and all of us are guests in it. All of us are guests in it. All of us enjoy the safety of that ceiling and the comfort of that ground. وَأَنزَلَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً and he sent down again this incredible gift, which is water from the sky. And through that gift, he brings forth fruits as provision for you. Rizq is like regular provision. It's not like a one-off and you have to worry how you're going to store it. It just keeps coming. As you need it, it's there. As you need it, it's there. These beautiful fruits from that earth, which is your bed brought forth from that sky, which is your ceiling, as it sends down its gift, which is water. That is the one you should be worshipping. The one who, this is the way he looks after you. In your own little homes, you all have your, your storage, your fridge, your cupboards, where you keep your food. And you think yourself self-sufficient. You think you've looked after yourself. But if you realize that that little home of yours, is this your metaphoric home? It might break, it might stay, you might move. It's just a little shelter. The real home you live in is the home of this earth. And the real food that comes to you is not kept in any fridge and no man can make it happen. All of us, even today, are desperately needy for the rain that comes from heaven and the fruits that come from earth. And if that rain were to stop or the fruits were to stop, your fridge would go empty and your home would not be a shelter for you. So just realize that this is the metaphoric home that you live in. It's the metaphoric fridge that feeds you. It's the metaphoric store of provision. The real home is that one and how needy we are for it. And so how foolish we are to think ourselves in a little, little home self-sufficient when we are ever so needy for his blessings. So why not devote yourselves to him? Isn't he worthy of that? That's the first instruction. And that's why it leads on nicely to the first prohibition of the Holy Quran. What is it? فَلَا تَجْعَلُوا لِلَّهِ أَنْدَادًا And so do not make for Allah the majestic, the all-perfect. Don't make anyone equal to him. He is the one that provides you and you turn your whole devotion to something else. You forget God and you live for your kids. 
You forget God, you live for your boss. You forget God, you live for this. All of that is the imbalance. And balance will come to you shortly. All of this is wrong. Because all of this is the gift from the one. It's through God we appreciate our children and our families and our opportunities and our relationships. There's no equal. There's only one. Don't make anything an equal to God in your devotion. Especially since you know. And what is there that we can know so immediately in this verse? It's this imagery that we are guests in God's house and we sit and eat from God's platter. And what is the platter? It's the fruit that comes from the rain. Once you know this incredible system that nurtures you, how on earth do you dare turn away from him? It's a fundamental metaphor, as you see, my, my friends. And it's right at the heart of the first instruction and the first prohibition of the Holy Quran. What's next in our Quranic firsts? What's the first good news of the Holy Quran? And why is good news in sort of uh, quotation marks? Is what I mean is the first thing the Quran calls good news. Otherwise, th there's other great things that might come before verse 25 of Surah Al-Baqarah. But the first time the Quran says, deliver something to make people happy. Uh, Bushra, they say it's from uh, Bashara in Arabic means your, means your skin. So Bushra is that incredible good news that just makes you glow. We just see it on your skin. This guy's received something amazing, something really cheered this person up. So give that cheer, in, cheer infusing good news to whom? To those who believe. We'll come back to believe in a little bit. And they do incredible, wholesome, good actions. What's the good news? That for them are jannat. Jannah, we will, we will come to. Uh, Jannah is the word for paradise. It's called gardens here in, in your translation. In the Arabic language, it means literally, because the root jannah means to conceal something, to hide something. Uh, that's why somebody majnoon is crazy because that person's intellect has been covered and it cannot be uh, seen or detected or felt or tapped into. A junna in Arabic is a shield because you kind of hide behind it and be protected by it. As we're at the doorsteps of the holy month, the Prophet Ali wasalam, he said, fasting is a shield. It's something which protects you. And so what's a janna? It's actually a sort of... Uh, it's a, a canopy of trees, so trees which are so lush, so plentiful that their branches interlock. And as their branches interlock, you have a canopy of branches over you, which protect you from the sun. You enjoy the beautiful shade beneath and you're concealed. That's the Jannah. And so the very word for paradise then is a reference to trees. And so the first good news is a good news of a dwelling in which you're overstretched by these beautiful trees that protect you. And underneath these trees, underneath the beautiful canopy of trees are running really beautiful gushing rivers. And there's more. Every single time they are given rizq, again, regular provision of a fruit in that garden, in God's garden, in the beautiful garden, in the eternal garden. What do you enjoy there? Fruit. And what's so fascinating about this fruit is that you recognize it. So when the people are given the fruit in the garden, they say, this is what we were given from before. And so what is this referring to? It's that the fruits we enjoy in this earth are actually a little bit of heaven that have come down to us. And it's a little bit of heaven. Why has a little bit of heaven come down to us? Is because part of God's welcoming us into his generosity of his eternal garden is that we're not in a place where everything is unfamiliar. Because when you want to find comfort, we all want comfort in what's familiar. 
yes, we want something unimaginable, but unimaginable and also familiar. We're not alienated. So even the gifts are familiar. We say, oh, this is just like such and such a fruit. This is just like such and such a fruit. So the fruit becomes a moment that ties your temporal existence with your eternal existence. Over there, you'll remember, it'll be a tie. Oh yes, these are those days. The fruits look the same, but the experience is incredibly different. Every fruit is its own wonder. Every fruit in that garden is its own separate joy, but it's familiar. And so the fruit you have here is preparing you. It's preparing you for, for, for your bliss. It's heaven that has come to you so that heaven will be familiar to you and comfortable and blissful and incredible. And just like in, on earth, what is the joy on this earth is to enjoy these pleasures with your partners. And so your partners will, will be there. Gardens and fruits that are familiar yet exquisitely unimaginable. And your partners are there with you, all purified, staying there in forever. This is where that garden differs from this garden, because one of the metaphors that come a lot is that however much we need the vegetation on this earth, it's very, very short lived. And so the vegetation there, the garden there, the provision there, how is it different? Not just exquisitely different, but it stays. That's the first good news of the Holy Quran. So our metaphor is pretty relevant. Let's continue. What's the first dua of the Holy Quran? The first dua is the dua that's put into our mouths. Ehdina Sirat al Mustaqim in Surah al Fatiha, guide us to the straight path. As an answer to the dua that we are encouraged to say or, or instructed to say, comes the entire book. That's why the very next uh, verse after the Fatiha is saying, That is the book. It is the guidance. So you pray for guidance. Here it is, the answer to the Fatiha. Within the guidance, what's the first dua? What's the first time someone is calling upon Allah for something? This is the first dua. And Abraham, alayhi salatu wasalam, when he said, oh my Lord, make this a land secure. He says, oh my Lord, Rabbi, in calling upon one, you nurture me, you look after me, you care for me, you're my tender Lord, so I'm turning to you, my Lord. Just a separate point, there's often no ya in front, the ya of o, oh, because o oh, typically, even in English, is typically for someone who's distant, oh, so-and-so means that they're far away. So the du'as of the prophets typically don't start with o, oh, they just start with rab, because the idea is Allah is very near. My Lord, my nurturing Lord, make this city, Amin. Make this, and he's referring to Mecca. And so Abraham, alayhi salatu wasalam, has been instructed by Allah to leave his, uh, uh, to leave his partner and to, or his wife. Uh, different, uh, there's some different uh, discussions on, uh, on Sayyidah Hajar. To leave Sayyidah Hajar and to leave their child in this barren valley and there was nothing there and Allah instructed him to leave them there so he did it the, the Khalil of Allah and then he walked away and he made this heartfelt dua and this dua comes more than once in the Holy Quran one of the real great duas that really set the scenes for this incredible civilization of faith whose house is the house of Allah in Mecca he said oh Allah make this a peaceful town Amin We'll talk about peace. I said safety is what we're going to come back to right at the end. Make it a very safe and peaceful town and provide its people with fruit. And this I said, one come back to right at the end, that there's something about safety that ties to vegetation in the Holy Quran. You can't nurture the ground in chaos. You cannot enjoy its fruits in chaos. And so he prays for two things, safety, peace, and fruit that they should be looked after. And that's the opening dua for the Holy Land, uh, for the Holy City of uh, Mecca. 
from which will come forth uh, from the seed from the seed of Abraham السلام, the chosen prophet وسلم, that blessed city that safe city what was its original dua that Allah should look after its people with the fruit of the ground because it was barren and keep its people safe and Ibrahim السلام, wanted it for those who have iman and so that there you can immediately see this parallel what is iman in arabic it's to enter yourself into safety the safety of allah's protection because there is no protection except from allah there's no fleeing there's no protection except the protection of allah iman is to enter god's protection and so he said make it safe for those who believe and give food uh, certainly give it give food uh, to those who believe uh, in this city who believe in god in the last day and Allah says, no, even those who have kufr. What is kufr in Arabic? It's actually a farming word. It's when you cover over the seed. This is kufr, it's to conceal it. So why is kufr the opposite of iman? Because it's concealing this seed of what it means to be human. That's inside all of us, the seed of faith. We are ordered to nurture the seed of faith by directing ourselves to Allah and entering into his safety. And anyone who refuses what is really known by human nature is just covering, concealing that which their own nature is calling them to. That's why the unbeliever is called the kafir, uh, the, the barrier, which is actually another word for farmer as well. Uh, but in this case, what he's burying is he's turning away from the seed. He's not nurturing the seed, He's burying it to turn away from it. So it stays out of sight, out of mind. And so Allah says, even the kafir, the one who conceals and turns away from his own seed of faith, I will give them fruit as well. But for them, the fruit is temporary enjoyment. And then they will go to where this kufr will lead them, turning away from the safety of God. Jalla Jalaluhu. But what is the fruit for the people of belief? It is a gift from Allah. And it's a preparation, the peace of heaven on earth that they'll be enjoying in heaven. The fruits are for all, but the significance of the fruit will differ. Are you of those who've entered the safety of God? Or are you of those who cover over that, that precious seed of faith? That's the first dua of the Holy Quran. Okay. What's the first story of the Holy Quran? Not to go into detail right now, but this is the first story. We'll be developing it uh, in our upcoming lessons. But the very first story of the Holy Quran is about Adam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying to the angels that Adam, and therefore the progeny of Adam, i.e. us, we have a role on earth. And the role is to be representatives of Allah on the earth. So there's something about earth that the human story is, is, is intrinsically tied to. We'll do, our, we'll, we'll do our best to tap into that uh, story or that relationship in two lessons time. Uh, the fact that we're created from earth, that we relate, we, we, we return to earth, we come out from earth, we are custodians of earth. So there's something about earth at the very beginning of the first story of the Holy Quran. And of course, what's right at the center of, the, of that first story is Adam is told, Live with your spouse in that garden. Eat plentifully wherever you will, but don't come near the tree. And, that, and like I said, the tree as the most impressive growth from the earth will cover, will be, will accompany man from the first right until the end. So we'll try to tap into various uh, angles of this very first story later on. But just to point out how important this metaphor is, it's in the first instruction and the first dua and the first good news and the first story. Very good. Second part is just to think about the seed. I said the seed is mysterious. It's not named very much in the Holy Quran, although it's ever present in this theme, which keeps coming again and again. That's part of its mystery. And indeed, every time it's referred to, it's referred to to point out its mysteriously small and therefore hidden nature. God's knowledge, God's justice, and God's blessing. That's what the seed is uh, within the Holy Quran. Let's look at uh, 
four verses, which are, I can only think of a fifth one where the seed is even mentioned or named uh, to the best of my knowledge. This is, uh, again, God's knowledge. And you see the, the mystery. It's all about mystery, uh, this verse. وَعِنْدَهُ مَفَاتِحُ الْغَيْبِ And with God alone are the مَفَاتِحُ الْغَيْبِ مَفَاتِحُ might mean keys to the unseen. مَفَاتِحُ could also mean مَفْتَحُ which means the treasuries, the stores of the unseen. The mysteries are his. The most hidden knowledge that no one knows except him, that's with him. The keys and the treasuries of the unseen are with him. No one knows them but him. And in addition to that, he knows all that is in the earth and all that is in the sea. Not only does he know all the things, but the slightest happenings that happen to them, he knows all of that. And what's the instance of the slightest happening? It's that little leaf when it falls. No leaf falls except he knows it. Every leaf is its beautiful, it has its own beautiful story, its own incredible architecture. It's been life to a creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then it falls forgotten to us, but it's not forgotten to Allah. It's important. It's significant. And every single leaf, he knows its fall. So not only does he know the mysteries and not only does he know whatever thing there is on the earth or in the sea, but every state of everything, he knows it. And not only that, but that little seed in the darknesses of the earth. You think of that little helpless seed and like I've emphasized today, Every life form is desperately needy for that seed to split and grow. And life would end if the seed is not nurtured. Who's looking after the tree? Who's looking after the seed? No one but the one who knows it. Helpless, small, insignificant, in the darknesses, under the ground, God knows it. God cares for it and God brings it forth. And in this metaphor is so much for us to think about because you and I, you know, however much you might feel sometimes alone, sometimes lost, at times maybe you don't feel loved, at times maybe you feel helpless, you should know that you are far bigger than a seed and how much he cares for that seed, he cares for you too. So just like the seed, you just have to sometimes, or we just have to sometimes just let the care of God take us over because only he is the one caring for us always. Nothing moist, nothing dry, everything is recorded in the knowledge of God. So the seed here is just the marker of the most intimate knowledge of Allah of everything. Here, similar, but with another angle. Here we have Luqman speaking to his son, giving his son advice. And his very second piece of advice, after telling his son not to make any partner with Allah, what does he say? He says, oh, my son, if all there is, if it is, if it is just the weight of a seed of mustard, which is a phrase for the, the smallest seed, and it is in a rock, you know, the, the, the smaller seed, somewhere in some crevice in a rock, who's going to know in some crevice in a rock, who's going to know about it? Or anywhere in the heavens, or anywhere in the earth, hide it wherever you want. God will bring it. God is subtle and all aware. Nothing evades him. There's no place that his knowledge does not penetrate and God will bring it. This is similar to the last angle, which is emphasizing his knowledge of Allah Most High. But in another angle to that, it's about the moral universe. That he's saying, oh, my son, whatever you do, you'll never be able to hide it from Allah. Whatever you do, if the seed is hidden and God will bring it, where, where's the bringing of God I, on judgment day? God will bring it to testify. So if you steal a mustard seed from someone, God will bring it and it will be evidence against you. 
And any little thing you do for someone, God will bring it. It will testify for you. So this is bringing the idea of God's knowledge of the seed into the moral universe now. That everything you do, you can't escape it. You have to remember Allah always. And be fair and be just and be right in your dealings on earth. And that's why the most explicit now, taking that from knowledge to your moral uh, awareness, now we're going to show that it really will come to pass, what Luqman said to his son. Allah SWT says, and we will place the, the scale pans on judgment day. No one will, will be wronged. Every little thing you've done, every charity and every wronging and everything will be placed right in front of your eyes, even that little seed of mustard i.e. the smallest thing, whatever it might be, we will be the reckoner and it will come to pass right in front of your eye. Again, the little seed as the measure of the insignificant thing that God is fully aware of, now coming fully into the moral space of man. But that little seed, which is the site of God's knowledge and care, is this incredible miracle on earth. And so there's nothing more blessed that you can think of quite like the seed. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses it as an example. If you want to know the parable, the example, the story, the likeness of those who spend their wealth in the way of Allah, there's nothing you can think of that signifies blessing that we deal with so openly like the seed because it's hidden, it's helpless, it's concealed. No one actually interferes with its process. But what happens? It grows. A stalk comes out. And you get seven ears of corn. And in each of them, you find a hundred seeds. And God multiplies for whomever he will. And God is vast. When he gives, he gives. There's nothing that his treasuries can't give. And he really knows when you give for his sake, he knows what's in your heart. He knows how difficult it might be. Maybe you wanted that money for something else and you preferred Allah over yourself. He knows what's in your heart. His treasuries are vast. Look at the blessing of the seed. Don't think that your charity is any less special than the blessing of the seed. And so you will get multiplications you can't imagine when you spend for his sake. And there's nothing to give you more comfort, to say that's how God does in the universe, just like, quite like the seed. Look at the blessed seed and you'll realize how much God can bless when he wishes to bless. Again, these subtle intimations within the Holy Quran that infaq, infaq is the word for spending in the cause of God, but literally it means to bury something or to conceal something or to dig a, a tunnel through something. A nafaq is a tunnel. So infaq, quite literally, means to conceal something into the ground. Because you're, you're, because you're taking this wealth away from you. And you're uh, hiding it from people and you're handing it over to Allah. In the good faith that God will bring something forth from it. And Allah says, yes, he will. Just like the seed. So even the vocabulary has this notion of concealing covering, digging, passing it on, and then that's the matter of the farmer, and the seeds will burst forth. So the seed is just the most blessed example that comes before us of the, the sheer blessings that Allah gives to those who are sincere. And not to forget to point out the relationship between the habba and of course hub, which is love. Uh, again, how, how the vocabulary is all related. Some say the habba of the, of the heart is the, is the most hidden part of your heart. And the hub is this devotion of your heart. And of course, love of God is what the story is all about. And it grows in your heart like a seed and you have to nurture it. As we draw our reflections to a close here, uh, we'll be going through our metaphors together in the upcoming lessons, but I just wanted one thing uh, 
which was just the theme of balance. Uh, before we look at the details of gratitude and the afterlife and hope and fear and need and, and the wonderful multitude of ways the Quran wants us to relate to this natural order, this vegetative order, just to zoom out and just to remember that it's his order and he's planned it perfectly and he's made it in balance. It's harmonious and it's only his. We have no control over it. However much you think you have control, you have no control. However much you think your efforts feed you, nothing feeds you but Allah's generosity. We might be 10 steps removed from the farmer. We've got our little store at home and then we got it from the store in the supermarket who got it from the store. However much you are removed, you have to realize it's the generosity of Allah and there's no middleman. There's no one else who feeds you. It's his balance. It's in, it's in his hand. So just very briefly, again, just the, the balance of everything. Uh, this passage from Surah Al-Hijr. And the earth, we spread it out so you could live on it. We put their mountains to keep it in place. The mountains are described as pegs to keep the earth in place. Uh, and we cause therein all manner of things to grow. Everything is in balance. Everything is in its place. Everything is just right. And we place therein the means of livelihood, everything you need. And that's what we forget, that it's not just food that we get from, from the ground. Your clothing comes from the ground. Uh, everything. Nowadays, you know, we, we have uh, some of our clothing comes from fibers that might come from plastics. But that comes from where? It comes from oil, which comes from what? It comes from vegetation that was compressed under the earth for, many, for a very long time. It's all from the vegetation. Uh, your, 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 what's in front of you? What am I looking at? I'm looking at, at a uh, computer screen right now. Track its story. You'll end up with the vegetation and the ground. Your clothing, track its story. Your home, track its story. Your table, track its story. Track the story of everything. It's all in the ground. This earth is the absolute treasure chest of the gifts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he brings it forth in his time. He will inspire people when he wills, with the technologies that he wills. And people bring forth unimaginable treasures from this earth. Look how amazed we are about our planes and trains and automobiles. And we don't know what further treasures Allah will inspire people to bring forth from this earth. It's the absolute treasure chest of the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he'll bring it forth in his time. Everything is in balance. He looks after you completely from this earth. And he looks after those that you don't provide for. And many commentators say it means the people that you do provide for. Meaning your children and your, your, your dependents. Because... We think we're providing for them. No, Allah is providing for them. We're just one step on the way, but Allah is providing for all. So when he brings forth that crop, which might be eaten by you directly or by an animal, which then you eat, at the end of the day, Allah is the one who's determining, oh, this is for you and this is for your child and this is for your wife and this is for so-and-so. Who is providing for your babies at home? It's not you. Allah has determined all of their food. And he's brought it out and he's ordered you to harvest it and to gather it. That's a duty between you and him, but you are not the provider. He's made everything in balance. He provides for you and for the people that you're not providing for. And many people say it is your dependence. You are not providing for them. He is the provider. There is nothing in this earth, but the keys to the treasuries are with Allah. And he sends it down. Everything in perfect balance, everything in its time. He might send down the rain or he might send down the inspiration of how to bring forth from the treasures of the earth. And the, the winds are part of this incredible system to feed you. And then the water as well. And unfortunately, this course is not long enough to talk about the winds, but the Quran talks a great deal about the wind. And then the water and then the drink, and you are the keepers of nothing. You are that you control nothing and you have determined nothing and you have limited nothing and you have nothing. 
You just have a duty of effort between you and Allah and the stores are all his and the balance is perfect. And we have the opening verses, the beautiful opening verses of Surah Al-Rahman to remind us again, he is the all merciful and it's tying together a real zooming out now of how this vegetative order fits within this, uh, the larger order of the all merciful. He is the all merciful, he is the all compassionate. And what's the first thing, the first gift that's being emphasized? He taught you the Quran. And we're about to enter into the month of the Holy Quran. And you have to all realize, and I have to realize, the Quran is the key to these incredible stores that Allah is referring to in these verses. The keys to the unseen, the treasuries of the earth, the mysteries of mysteries. The Quran is the key to all of that. If you want to really know who you are and where you are and where you live, what is the mystery of the apple and the mystery of the grape and the mystery of the grass and the mystery of the ant? How are each of these just reflecting aspects of the divine glory? What is the key to all? It's the Holy Quran. That's why it comes first here. The great gift of the All Merciful is he taught the Quran. And so let this month be for all of us a time to really, really approach the, the holy book with all of our being and ask Allah to open up something of its treasuries, something of its stored wisdom. He created man. He taught him speech so he could learn from the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we have the beautiful balance. And the real emphasis here is on balance. There's the sun and the moon all in a perfect calculation. The najm and the shajr are in prostration. In my translation here, it says the stars and trees prostrate. So the stars and trees are facing each other as two opposites almost in that order. All, again, their prostration is they're surrendering to the divine order. Najm in Arabic, another uh, meaning of the word najm actually is the stalkless um, herbage of the earth. You can say, you know, bushes and then shajr are the stalked her her be, her stalked plants, meaning trees. So trees and all other plant life are, in, are, are, are the najm. So najm, just the very fact that the Arabic language has the same word for the star and for the stalkless plant. All of that is in harmony. The sky he is raised and he's placed the balance. Do not transgress in the balance. And so this is a reference to uh, first of all, just the fact that we have to realize as we approach this natural order, Allah has made it harmonious. We have to realize our place in that. And our place in that is to celebrate the harmony, to serve the harmony, to enter and be in harmony with the harmony that's around us, which is frustration, of course, is how we enter the, the real harmony that's around us. And then that, that very stern threat do not transgress the harmony. Do not transgress the balance. And so that's something for us to bear in mind as we think about how we relate to the world around us. And of course, what the commentators also stress is that just like God has made an order in balance, we in our civilizations have to make societies in balance. And so this sort of stern threat, don't transgress the balance, is often understood to mean very literally. When we weigh for each other in the, in the shop, we have to weigh fairly. When we pay, we pay fairly. When we have a contract, we honor the contract. God has made a harmonious universe around us. Our job is to make a harmonious society in which we live. Anything else, uh, any transgression from us, any oppression, any injustice, is just tantamount to the sun not, not, not rising one day. And you know that life would die instantly. We are killing our societies if we don't maintain harmony, justice, balance, just as God has made balance around us. That's why it says really explicitly now. And when you measure, measure with justice, don't oppress in the, in the measuring, instantly going to a moral exhortation. Learn from harmony in the environment to bring harmony into your human environment in every single part of your dealings. And he's placed the earth for all creatures and in it are fruits and palm trees, beautiful. And we have 
uh, date palms with their sheets and their grains and their fragrant herbs. So how are you denying the favors of your Lord? How do you turn away from him? And that's why the last theme, and we end here. This is the last thing I wanted to share here today. It's a surah, many of you will, will, will know, Surat Quraysh. It's a surah that speaks to the uh, tribe of the Prophet, Ali Salatu Wasalam, reminding them of a particular blessing. And the uh, blessing at hand is the blessing that the people of Quraysh, well, what they did was they, they decided to settle about five or six ancestors of the Prophet وسلم, they came and settled around the Kaaba. Previously, the Kaaba was a place that there was no life or settlement. People would come from afar to do Hajj and leave. Come to do Hajj and leave. Out of their respect for the Kaaba, no one settled around the Kaaba. And one of the ancestors of the Prophet والسلام, uh, Husay ibn Kilab is his name, he decided to gather his tribe, the people of Quraysh, to settle around the house. And they lived in extreme want and need and impoverishment. Uh, but then as, as the generations went on, they found a way to benefit from their being the caretakers of the Kaaba because then they used to serve the pilgrims who came to make Hajj. And so their respect grew in Arabia and they came to be known as the people of Allah because they looked after the pilgrims and they looked after the house. As their respect grew in Arabia, they started making these trade journeys in the winter and in the summer in complete safety. Uh, every, any other trade caravan would be raided, but the caravan of Quraysh traveled in safety to go to the, to the Sham in the summertime, Syria, Palestine. Uh, and to do trade there and to gather the, the fruits and the uh, beautiful uh, wares that they could get, bring them back to Mecca. And in the wintertime, they travel south in safety to Yemen. And they would trade and bring back, the, bring back the goods for Yemen. And then they flourished in trade, although they lived in this barren city. And so Allah in the surah is saying, look, how Allah's made these trade journeys comfortable for you because of the honor you've acquired from looking after his house. So it's saying, so then, like we saw in the first instruction today, so lower yourself in devotion to the Lord of this house. He's the one who gave you food from your hunger and he gave you safety from your fear. Why well, do I want to end today on this theme? Because this is where our theme started as well. What was the prayer of Abraham, Ali for the for this holy city? It was safety and fruit. And Allah is saying, look, because you devoted yourself to the house, I gave you safety and you were, you were in fear. You were exposed. You were helpless in this sort of wild lands of Arabia and desert raids. I gave you safety by the blessing of my house. And I gave you food because they say that the dua of Abraham was answered because very close to Mecca was the city of Ta'if, which was a very uh, fertile city. And so the fruits of Ta'if would come. Well, I say relatively, yeah, not, not immediately, yeah, but the fruits of Ta'if would come and feed the people of Mecca. And so Allah is saying, I gave you food and I gave you safety. So isn't it time that you should surrender yourself to me? And this is a message for all of us. It's that we cannot separate the discussion of vegetation from the discussion of safety. Uh, farming uh, requires safety, requires security, requires peace. Iman, Islam, all of these words are about entering yourself into the abode of salam, of peace. Entering yourself into the abode of aman, security, the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so there's some fundamental relationship between faith and between life that comes from this earth. And so that's just where I want to end my initial reflection, my, intro, my introductory reflection of today is that uh, we have to be grateful for the peace and the safety that we enjoy, that we have homes, that we stay in safety. And that's why we can enjoy the foods that we enjoy. We enjoy uh, dishes of such exquisite, you know, 
ingredients and this is an Indian dish, an Arabian dish. There's so much culture, so much pleasure in the foods that we enjoy. And all of that is brought about because we live in safety. We aren't afraid. We aren't running to hide from threats constantly. And so as we appreciate the blessings of food, we cannot separate that from the blessing of safety. And it's in being grateful for the blessing of the two that these blessings perpetuate in our lives. And we will not flourish in anything else we're trying to do if we don't have the simple blessing of safety and food. And what is the way to show gratitude for the blessing of safety and food? It's in devoting ourselves totally, single-heartedly to the one who gave us all of this because we entered this world helpless. We are like that little seed. No one sees us. No one nourishes us. No one tells your body to heal when it cuts and no one can influence that. We are just in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What we are asked to do in the Holy Quran is to recognize that and turn to him and surrender to him and glorify him and remember him. And in the call of the Holy Quran to become like him. I learn about his names, learn about his giving, learn about his perfection and try to represent that on this earth. That's what it means to be his Khalifa on this earth. And Allah sent us that model of what it means to represent Allah on earth in perfection. And that, Muhammad, and that model is Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so he is the key to the book and the book is the key to him, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So let's approach the book, approach the messenger who brought the book, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and through that approach Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Why? Because we owe it to him. If nothing else comes to your mind, because he keeps you safe and he gives you food. And that was the message of this uh, short surah of the Holy Quran. So that's our overview of the verses on the Verdia. And inshallah ta'ala, we will uh, next week start with our discussion on nourishing sky. Uh, ta'ala. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Sorry if I've talked uh, a little bit more than an hour and I said I wouldn't go over the hour, so I apologize for that. Let me now go to see if there are any comments here to look at. Okay. I'm not sure if you see all these comments. I'll just read out the, even some nice comments as well. It just says, I cried tears of joy writing my notes for this session. Uh, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. That's the, the, the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah bless you. Um, my question is, kufr is made analogous to burying something. Is Iman the opposite? Yeah, this is really excellent. And we have to really be uh, curious as we look at the Quranic metaphors. So all I'll say is keep thinking. It's not, my, it's not for me to wrap together all the, the metaphors. Rather, it's for us to revisit the metaphors as we go through life and we'll keep looking at the seed looking at the plant looking at our life looking at our problems in different angles that's all i'll say it's, it's not a uh, single metaphor or a single angle but yes it's a very good question if kufr is burying is iman the opposite uh, is iman like the sprouting so all i'll say is keep thinking as we go through the the lessons we'll see more and more of these uh, vocabulary items for us to visit. But all I will say is that uh, if we look at Surat uh, Washamsi Waduhaha, it speaks about the, uh, the soul as something we have to nurture. And so in that surah, it says, Qad aflaha man zakkaha. Aflaha, falah also means harvest. So we'll see now. You, uh, Iman might not be the opposite, but falah, success, is about that growth, that harvest. So inshallah, we'll look at falah coming up. And the verse is qad aflaha. He has truly harvested success. The one who zakaha. Zakat also means wholesome growth. And so what we are ordered to do with our soul, our soul is like a seed in this metaphor. We're ordered to nurture it. 
So although it's not in our power, like I said, no one can split the seed and make the seed grow. But what we do have to do is bury, nurture, water, tend to. If you don't tend to it, it's all going to, going to die. Uh, that's why farmers work, work incredibly hard for their harvest. They can't influence it. They can't make it happen, the actual fact of it. But there's steps that they have to take if they want a great harvest. And so faith is like that. We have to take steps for the great harvest. And those steps in the Quranic, you know, recurring description is Iman and Amal Salih. It's faith and it's good deeds. So what the Quranic metaphor is, we have to be farmers of the soul. And different words will come to that. Iman, to the best of my knowledge, is not, it's not from the farming metaphor. Iman is about entering into the safety. It's coming out of the storm, coming into the peace. Islam is about entering the salam. All of it is about surrendering to Allah. But there might be other words we'll see as we go through our metaphor, and I'm introducing you to some now. Falah, tazkiya. These are the farming words. So to continue the metaphor, we have to farm the soul. Bring out its virtues. Kufr is about burying the soul so you can neglect it. Out of sight, out of mind. So kufr is the burying of neglect. I don't want to deal with it. Let's get rid of it. That is kufr. What we have to do is nurture. So kufr is the opposite of nurturing then, if you can see then. It's the non-nurturing. Faith is about nurturing. And you'll see quite a few words. I've introduced two just in answering your question. Falah or in this verse, iflah, bringing out the harvest, and tazkiya, encouraging wholesome growth. These are the two opposites that are, uh, we can say so far, for the burial of the seed. Uh, it's really fascinating. A question two, not all seeds grow. Some are planted, yet nothing germinates. No growth comes forth. Is there still blessing in that kind of sowing or planting? Well, if you're talking about in real life, yes, what is the, the blessing? It's God reminding us. It's not a magic trick. And the seed has no power of its own. So sometimes when things don't go according to plan, is that, that's, that's actually more important than when things go according to plan. Because that's the time when God is just uh, reminding you that um, I'm the one. So by all means, nurture the seed, water the seed, but turn to me, rely on me, don't forget that. And that was that, that passage from Surah Al-Hijjah that we saw earlier today. So if one learns that from the seed not germinating, then that's a huge blessing. Other than that, this is the, the, the way of God. That's why we saw in that passage that he brings everything forth in a measure and he's the provider. This is interesting. Uh, question, our hearts are like the seed out of which the tree of Iman grows into a majestic splendor or not, depending on how we water and nourish it. Might be interesting to look at the meaning of the word for heart to gain a deeper understanding of this. Yeah, it's really fascinating. So the word habba is also used for what they call the, I think it's suwayda al-qalb, like the real core of the heart is called the habba as well in Arabic the seeds. We already have a word then for habba, the exact word for seed, for the depth of, of the heart. The heart has a variety of words, each for a metaphor. So what this course is introducing you to, yeah, just keep thinking about words. Um, the word for qalb is, it comes from the, uh, the word qalaba, which means to turn something over, to flip something. So what the most common interpretation of this is, it's the thing which turns, because your heart can turn from one direction to the other. In the words of the hadith, our hearts are between the two fingers of the all merciful. And that's why we ask Allah, O turner of the hearts, keep our hearts firm. We're conscious that hearts can turn. And that's why, again, we have to watch the heart throughout our life. You can never say, my heart faces the right direction, I'm at peace. You have to always work, always be the, in the earlier metaphor, the farmer of your heart, always keeping track. But as you asked me this question, it did remind me because part of what farmers have to do to keep the ground fresh is to keep turning the, the soil over. You know, because the soil on top gets a bit dry, so you turn it over, turn it over, turn it over to keep it fresh. So this is something I've, you know, that could also, which is exactly the meaning of qalb. 
So from that use of the, the way you're indicating in your question, it's quite, you know, it, it, it's a nice angle then. That's the thing we must always keep it, i.e. keep it fresh. Keep it fresh, keep it fresh. If you want it to stay uh, fertile. That's a good angle that comes out of your question actually uh, for the word qalb. So, so that's something that you've brought out really. And that's why I said it's a sort of, this is a group exercise. I don't have answers. I have reflections I share. And you have reflections that you share, and it's in this sort of, sort of group uh, contemplation that we can uh, develop the metaphor and find different ways to relate to our material. Can you comment how much verdia and nature plays a role in Islamic poetry and art throughout history? Islamic art, a very, very great deal, because in Islamic art, uh, we were told not to depict. Uh, animate life and so the depiction of animate life you'll still see some instances in Islamic art but what you find much much more than is the non-animate and beautiful and what Islamic art uh, you know to the best of my observation what is non-animate and beautiful it seems there's three things that strike out a lot or that's that strikes one sorry not, not strike out but that strikes one a lot one is the beauty of the written word and that's why calligraphy is one of the most central of the Islamic arts. One is the beauty of mathematical forms. And that's why geometric patterns are the iconic. If you Google Islamic art, it's about mathematical forms, actually, geometric patterns. And the last thing you'll find in Islamic art is, of course, uh, uh, plant-based art, leaves, trees, uh, you'll find that in different illuminations. Uh, so I'll say definitely yes. It's one of, into my estimation as a non-specialist, a complete non-specialist in Islamic art, I'll say yes, it appears one of the three recurring themes, certainly in art. As for poetry, uh, I'll have to think about it. I mean, again, I speak not as an expert, but a lot of the poetry in Islamic history repeats the images, the imagery of pre-Islamic poetry. And a lot of that, of course, as you can imagine, is celebrating uh, the herbiage, celebrating life. The Arabs celebrate life a great deal because they see it. They see the dead come to life. I used to live in the Middle East and I grew up, in, I did my secondary school in Doha, Qatar. Uh, and uh, I moved from England. So the first shock to me was in England, we complain about the rain, right? That's where I did my primary school. I went to, to, to Doha and it's like, everyone gets happy when it rains. I thought, what on earth is this? I've never experienced this um, before really. And then the really interesting phenomenon was that when it did rain, you would leave the city and people, there were these uh, little, like, like little ponds in the desert and people would really take their family, essentially a huddle, and people would take their families, take some coffee mugs, you just sit around uh, in the desert, around nothing, around this little pool of where the rainwater has uh, gathered. So all I'll say is right until the modern day, the Arabian man and Arabian woman, they appreciate life, the life that comes forth in a dead uh, desert. And so that's a, uh, in the pre-Islamic uh, poetry, and that continues of course into, uh, Islamic uh, literature as well. It's all that comes to mind uh, from your question. So I'll say, I'll say almost certainly. That's a fabulous question number five. It's not going to come, but I wanted to bring it out somehow. Is one of the lessons going to be on Al-Khidr as a symbol of Verdia? He is the green man. So who is Al-Khidr? Al uh, the name is not used in the Holy Quran. It's a reference to one of the most mysterious stories in Surat, in the Holy Quran, it comes in Surat Al Kahf, where Musa alayhi salatu was salam uh, uh, seeks out this special person who has mysterious knowledge. And the Quran just refers to him as a slave of the slaves of God. And the hadith refers to him as Al Khadr or Khidr, two ways that it's pronounced. And Khidr is exactly the root of Verdia. Verdia, if you've studied you know, French, will say verde is, is green. It just means green, G greenage. 
And khidr is exactly the root from, you know, we get the color akhdar, which means green. So this man is verdia. He is the verd man, if you like, the, the green man. And why is he called the green man? Some say it's a reference to a uh, blessing that wherever he would go, the earth would come to life. And so it was a, uh, a greenery and the green man is a reference to the blessed man, uh, therefore. So I'm glad someone brought it up because I, I didn't, I, I'm not going to find a way to bring this out in our very short coverage here. So I'm glad you mentioned it. Al-Khidr as the green man. Very, very good. Um, to the best of what I can see, this is the end of our questions. We have some very nice, encouraging comments. Um, it's amazing how interconnected words and concepts are in the Arabic language. Um, another gentleman with the tears of joy. Uh, another gentleman saying the depths of the language is incredible. Alhamdulillahi uh, Rabbil Alameen. This is the, uh, what does the, the Holy Quran say? قُلْ بِفَضْلِ اللَّهِ وَبِرَحْمَتِهِ فَبِذَلِكَ فَلْيَفْرَحُوا هُوَ خَيْرٌ مِمَّا يَجْمَعُونَ it's a reference to the Holy Quran. Uh, uh, because that's what the previous verse speaks of. It says, say by the bounty of Allah, in the bounty of Allah, and in his mercy, let them rejoice. I, we should be like over the moon happy, like giddy in happiness because of the bounty of Allah. And the bounty of Allah is, of course, this, uh, this uh, book. Uh, the verse that comes right before this one uh, don't, don't, uh, is, is about that we sent down to you a cure for what is in the hearts. And so this book is a cure for what's in the heart. It's the bounty of Allah. And you should be crazy happy when you approach, when you approach this book. And so we are entering the month of the book. So our goal, to use this phrase that came to me right now, crazy happy. So that's, our, that's what you have to think about. Farah, absolute joy. This is what we have to feel. So that's, so I'll, that's what, we, uh, what we have time for, for, for today. So I will leave you here uh, with our uh, introductory uh, remarks. And uh, sow a seed, of course, is our theme. Uh, uh, for our program this month in the holy month. So please do consider uh, donating to the college uh, in planting a seed, uh, a seed inshallah ta'ala that will bring forth uh, great good uh, for our communities nationally and internationally. Thank you all very much. I look forward to seeing you all next week. Uh, same time, same channel, inshallah ta'ala.